हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर महेश कालरा डायरेक्टर सेंटर फॉर नोमिस्मेटिक इंफॉर्मेशन एंड स्टडीज आई वेलकम यू टू दिस मॉड्यूल ऑन हिस्टोरियोग्राफी ऑफ नोमिस्मेटिक्स हियर आई विल बी टेकिंग यू थ्रू द एंटायर सब्जेक्ट ऑफ नोमिस्मेटिक्स टू अंडरस्टैंड द मीनिंग द डेफिनेशन द स्कोप ऑफ नोमिस्मेटिक स्टडीज टू अंडरस्टैंड इट्स प्रोग्रेस इन इंडिया अलॉन्ग विद नंबर ऑफ इट्स पायोनियर्स Uh, we will also study and understand the role of numismatic societies across the world in promotion of numismatic research also we'll be briefly looking at the upcoming trends in numismatic studies so understanding numismatics uh, is very simple it's the study of coins and related money objects as a source of uh, history of the people of a country of a region in recent and distant past um, basically numismatics is study of coins from two aspects the first study it consists of a study of the coin as a part of series for its common prototypes uh, rarities aberrations and other peculiarities uh, this is a study which involves basically the numismatists to actually get acclimatized with the various series that uh, coins of various parts of the world involve so for example if one is studying the coinage of ancient greek world he has to familiarize himself with how these coins are what are the varieties what are the rarities in this series and so on and so forth so this is a internal study which is done by numismatists uh, for the last 150 years and this is what actual numismatics hardcore numismatics involves the second is a study of its uh, uh, use as a tool for acquiring more knowledge about the use of coins as monetary units its historical relevance its economic significance and some cultural messages that come across from various coins that we examine so why do we study coins uh simply because coins are available and they survive multiple centuries to tell the tale they are actual proofs of various historical events dates places though many may have some exaggerated claims but no lesser than the epigraphs of the rulers of the past uh, st- coins by themselves survive because simply they are metals which actually antiquate and survive um, unlike many other things of the past which don't survive hence we have the saying by sir thomas brown uh, where he says time which antiquates antiquities and hath made an art to make dust of all things hath yes spared these minor monuments though this uh, saying is not actually in relation to numismatics or coins but it has been applied by some of the past pioneers to actually describe the main role of numismatics um when we look at the development of numismatics we have to take a larger view and uh, we have to see at the beginnings of the subject in renaissance europe uh, the field began as a pursuit of the european nobility and the royalty in the early renaissance period and at this period there was a uh, italian poet by the name petrarch he was one of the first persons to have recordedly shown some interest in coins that is roman coins and greek coins that were found in large numbers attracted his attention and he realized their significance as a source of history of the rulers of the past since renaissance basically included the uh, study of various types of knowledges Petrarch began to encourage other important dignitaries of the European world some were popes some were emperors a uh, few others were uh, kings of minor kingdoms uh, because at this day uh, uh, time Europe was basically divided into minor states uh, like the uh, elector of Brandenburg what is today Berlin and then there was the emperor of France all of them actually cal- collected coins for personal uh, amusement and also for institutions of repute thus began the term for numismatics hobby of kings uh, because of its associations with the royalty the first series to be studied in detail was the coinage of the roman and byzantine emperors uh, for its antiquarian value to the collectors the earliest book on roman numismatics was by a very influential french man guillem boud and it was said to have been written in latin with the title 
the acid at Patibus and published in 1514. So today uh, we see across Europe, all the cabinets are basically in a rush to see which are the oldest books that they have on the subject. And this is what preoccupies a lot of coin cabinet uh, curators across Europe. Now we'll have to look at the Indian attitude to coins in the medieval period, which coincided with the Renaissance and the later period. Um, uh, during the medieval period, especially during the Mughal period, coins of the previous period uh, were not tolerated for various reasons. One of the reasons was the concept of Sikka and Khutbah, which essentially was an exercise by the Mughal emperor to emphasize his sole ownership and uh, sovereign status over the rest of the rulers. Uh, this led to the concept of basically not allowing or destroying earlier coinages. Another reason was the concept that came under uh, Akbar the Great was evaluating coins in proportion to their age. That is, it was connected to the date of issue. Uh, coins of the current year were valued at a higher value than coins of the older period under a system termed as Batta. This was also called as Sarf, basically. Uh, so coins according to this system were fairly or unfairly divided into three categories. That is Sikka, Chalni and Khazana. Sikka was the coins of the current year. Chalni were coins of few years old. And Khazana was what was termed at uh, value, whose value was termed and declared by the Mughal state as being equal to the intrinsic value or metal-like value of the coin. And this meant that the coin was basically to be rejected or melted. Another thing was that the concept of melting also was meticulously applied to old coins uh, of the earlier rulers, which were considered as demonetized uh, and said to be exchanged or melted in the mint. This system was abused by money changers who used to assume that there was a loss of weight, inherent loss of weight for older coins and thus they began giving lower exchange rates for older coins. This led to being there being no incentive for holding or keeping old coins in India of that period. Uh, however, we many, time, many times come across old coins being hoarded, especially in the late Mughal period in view of the insecure political environment across the country. Furthermore, uh, Mughal laws were very, very uh, fixed on foreign coins. Uh, there were restrictions on them being brought into the country and there was an insistence by the Mughal emperors on their being melted at ports rather than being brought into the country. Also, bullion was to be declared at a port city and only to be brought into the country in the form of Mughal coins. We see these uh, restrictions and these measures being described by uh, visitors to India like Tavernier and few other European travelers who were checked for these uh, foreign coins as well as bullion. Uh, Mughals kept growing across the subcontinent and this led to these uh, restrictive measures being implemented throughout the country. Certain Mughal currencies were also banned after the lifetime of the emperor um, one notable example is the zodiac currency of Jahangir. These were banned by his son and successor Shah Jahan, who followed him because they were deemed as un-Islamic by the Islamic scholars. Hence he ordered the melting of this very beautiful and rare uh, coin which are hence found in very small numbers today. So we see a very uh, uh, big negligence on part of the Indian rulers simply because they didn't understand the value of older coins as objects of historic value. But we see at the same time a trend in Europe, especially in the 18th century, to export coins to European uh, homelands. And this was especially done by Dutch merchants. We see many of the European institutions at this period, along with private collectors, showing interest in what were termed as oriental coins. And we see a large number of uh, uh, zodiac signs hence making their way to European collectors. One notable example is a German collector, Philip P. Adler. Uh, he basically came to acquire a lot of Mughal coins. 
And we, I have come across a certain letter written by Adler to a fellow collector where he mentions his own Dutch contact as a Mr. Diesman, the director of the Dutch East India Company in Amsterdam. He actually records the purchase of these coins at an exorbitant rate, especially a 7.5% rate applied because of the rarity of these coins. Adler's entire collection of 28,000 Oriental coins came to the SMB Museum Berlin after it was uh, sold by her, his widow in 1820 at the rate of 18,000 German thalers. So we see this uh, trend picking up in Europe where many families come to acquire collections because of uh, their contacts with the Asia, especially India. We also come across this very interesting example of a, a colonel, Charles Seaton Guthrie, uh, who died in 1875. He was an engineer with the Bengal army in the early 1820s and he began making a co oriental collection totaling about 15,263 coins. In 1876, he offered to sell, sell these coins first to the British Museum at the rate of $5,000. Later, these were purchased by the Kaiser Friedrich Museum currently called as the SMB Museum in Berlin. And it purchased Guthrie's entire oriental collection for a meager amount of 3,500 pounds. Uh, amongst his collections, thus we see a number of rare coins of great value today lying in a museum in Berlin. So this is one of the coins uh, one has come across from the Berlin Museum collection, which might have belonged to either Adler or to uh, uh, Guthrie. Thus we see a number of important Indian uh, numismatic collections are in various foreign museums. Notably, the leader amongst all is the British Museum. Then the next is Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Then there is Stadtlich Museen zu Berlin in Berlin. And there is another department of Islamic numismatics called FINT uh, at the University of Tübingen, Germany, which has a number of Indian coins, especially Mughal coins, because this is the department of Islamic numismatics. Then there is the American Numismatic Society uh, located in New York, which has a very big collection of Indian coins. Then there is also the Smithsonian Museum located in Washington, D.C., said to be one of the biggest collections of Indian coins in the American subcontinent. Hermitage Museum, which is located in St. Petersburg, also has a number of Indian coins, amongst which are very rare Mughal coins, which were collected again by the Tsar of Russia. Uh, also, we have the Kunsthistorisches Museum located in Vienna, Austria, which also has a very decent number of Mughal coins. Notable amongst this is the Ram Sita Tanka of Akbar, which is a very rare half mohar issued by Akbar with images of Ram and Sita. Uh, also, the collection of Bibliothèque Nationale de France, BNF, located in Paris, are yet not known because this collection is close to public and researchers as of now, but it has a very notable collection. So we see uh, that this trend of collecting coins led to the recognition in entire Europe that coins were a genuine source of history in the 19th century itself. And this led to various societies being formed abroad in the 19th century, notably amongst this was the Royal Numismatic Society, which was formed in 1836 the American Numismatic Society, 1856, and both of these societies began to engage in systematic study of coins of various series. Interestingly, RNS or uh, Numismatic Society of uh, Royal Numismatic Society also began one of uh, the earliest English journals, Numismatic Chronicle, which began recording a number of Indian coin series. In the French-speaking world, the La Revue, La Revue Numismatic was first published in 1835. This also is a very interesting journal which records few of Indo-Greek coins, rare coins found in Afghanistan. Thus we see in India, the base for numismatics uh, proper study was set 
with the setting up of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784 by Sir William Jones. He was not only the first judge of the Supreme Court of Bengal, but he also began the society's first journal, Asiatic Researches. This was to later emerge as the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, JASB. And later, much later, it had its own numismatic supplement, which we'll be dis describing a little later. In Bombay, the Asiatic Society of Bombay, uh, uh, then known as the Bombay branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, also had its own journal, JBBRAS, published from 1841. Both these societies received a number of coins from British patrons from various parts of the Indian subcontinent, which later contributed to their study by various numismatic scholars. Additionally, the development of archaeology and the development of the idea of importance of coins as important markers for dating a dates dating sites in archaeological excavation led to more intensive studies in numismatics world over and especially in India. We also find at this period a number of pioneers began emerging in the field, uh, some of them who contributed seminally to Indian numismatics. The main figure who come, we come across is James Princip. Uh, he was basically an Anglo-Indian scholar who engaged uh, in the study of antiquities of the 19th century, uh, but chiefly he was also responsible for discovering uh, the two scripts of Brahmi and Karoshti in 1834. And he also was the essay master of Indian government, first at Kolkata, and later he became the secretary of the Mint Committee, where he oversaw a modernization of East India Company's Indian coinage. Apart from his official duties, he was also devoted to Indian coins and inscriptions. He used the Indo-Greek coins as a vital help to decipher the two scripts mentioned. In his own lifetime, which was very short, he uh, managed to discover the two scripts and decipher them, but he only came to name them as Indian Pali and Aramic Pali in his lifetime because the names were not known to him. Uh, also importantly in uh, Princeps case was the fact that he had to study all the coin series and thus we have a very important monograph uh, by Princeps where he describes all the prevalent coins of 19th century then current in India across the whole country. Uh, Princeps was not alone his, you know, in his own mission. He was uh, working along with a team of collaborators. Chief amongst this was his own Indian Pandits uh, from Kolkata. His work on Brahmi was also aided by the work of predecessors like Charles Wilkins, who had earlier deciphered a Pala inscription in 1788. Princip also received a number of inscriptions of Ashoka, Ashokan period, many of the coins with inscriptions in Brahmi from uh, British administrators across the Indian subcontinent. He was also aided by a young military cadet by the name Alexander Cunningham, who was his sounding board during the final phases of decipherment of Brahmi and Kharoshti. Princip also received very vital help in deciphering Kharoshti from the mysterious Charles Mason, who was a runaway from the Bengal army, but toured Kabul and Peshwa, Peshawar region. Now we look at the role of Charles Mason. He was born as James Lewis and he deserted East India Company this is Bengal army in 1827. In those periods, actually deserting the army uh, led to a death sentence. Hence, he escaped to Kabul uh, with a supposed American name, Charles Mason, and he claimed to be from Kentucky. As a result, he explored Afghanistan and its antiquarian sites very extensively. And most of these have been very beautifully documented by a a ledger that uh, Mason managed throughout his stay in uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, chief amongst this was a study of series of Buddhist stupas, then known as Buddhist topes, which were basically uh, studied by Charles Mason. One of these was Tope Kelan. It was located in a village called Hadda, and this was excavated by him in 1834. He also studied uh, many inscriptions, Chief amongst his discoveries was the Ashokan Edict of Shabazz 
Gadi, which was in Karoshti. We also come across a number of his uh, notes where he mentions any kinds of guest estimates, various letters in Karoshti. Thus, he was a chief help to James Princep in deciphering Karoshti in this very important and vital period of both Indian numismatics and epigraphy. Now we come to a person whose uh, role was again very distinctive in the field of numismatics and that is Sir Alexander Cunningham. Uh, he began as a young military officer as I already said who met and aided James Princep in the early period. Later in his military career he benefited from visiting almost all parts of India where he undertook a number of uh, discoveries of Buddhist sites, chief amongst which was Shravasti, Koshambi and a number of other sites. Uh, this led to his being appointed as the first founder director general of the ASI, that is the Archaeological Survey of India, when it was founded in 1861. His major contribution to Indian numismatics came in the form of two books. Uh, the first book was Coins of Ancient India which was published in his lifetime in 1891 and this was basically a very detailed organized study of ancient Indian coinage for the first time ever and importantly it was aided by his practical discoveries on the ground. The second was his book called Coins of Medieval India which again was uh, basically focusing on early medieval coins uh, restricted up till the 12th century that is before the Islamic period began in the Indian subcontinent and this was published posthumously in 1893. Another important uh, aspect to Alexander Cunningham was also his huge collection of Indian coins which was then sold to the British Museum. A large number of his coins were also drowned when one of the ships taking these coins to uh, London was basically drawn, drowned off the Sri Lanka coast. Another set of two people who again uh, were proactive excavators and looking at discovering coins were two Europeans uh, generals, uh, General Jean Baptist Ventura and Captain Allard. Both were in the employ of Maharaja Ranjit Singh who was a very dynamic ruler and believed in employing European soldiers for his army. Importantly, these two gentlemen uh, made some important discoveries. General Ventura went on to find what is termed as the Manikyala Stupa in 1830 and its important findings were actual indo scythian and Indo-Greek coins in this important Buddhist context. Uh, importantly, a lot of coins of both these generals were also again deposited in Europe. Some of the coins were stolen or lost, uh, but some of these possibly were uh, deposited in collections in the West. Uh, another important achievement at this period in the late 19th century was the discovery of the two names Brahmi and Karoshti as the names for the two scripts deciphered by Princip that is Indian Pali and Aramaic Pali. Uh, this was incidentally discovered by a Chinese specialist uh, by the name Terrien de la Coupere. Uh, he was a French uh, sinologist who first discovered that there was a 16 list of 64 scripts mentioned in the Buddhist text Lalit Vistar Sutra. Uh, chief amongst these uh, references is uh, the references to Siddharth, the future Buddha, mastering amongst other things scripts at a Brahmin school. The discoveries of uh, Terrien de la Coupier were again basically revisited by Professor uh, George Buller. Uh, George Buller was basically a professor of Sanskrit and he discovered that and connected the dots when it came to the names of the scripts Brahmi or Brahma as it was termed and Kharoshti uh, matching the orthographic features of these two scripts. One of his important uh, other contribution was that he also purchased a lot of coins which he then donated or sold to the Berlin Museum. Another person uh, who was again seminal to the study of Indian coins was William Marsden. He was again based in Southeast Asia, but he came to bring out one of the first volumes of a numismatic book in 1823 and 25, termed as the Numismatica Orientalia Illustrata. Its second volume had a section on coins of Hindustan, 
and importantly he also again donated or sold his entire coin collection including his beautiful Mughal and Gupta coins to the British Museum. Today these coins again are if can be examined by any scholar going to the British Museum under the name Mars, Marsden Collection. Uh, based on these uh, uh, number of coins coming into the British Museum, a number of British Museum curators began working uh, in a correlation with scholars on the ground. Chief amongst this was E.J. Rapson, who took a very keen interest on coinages of the Satwans and the Western Chhatrapas and many other Western Indian series. His book titled The Catalogue of Coins of Andhra Dynasty was again first published by the British Museum in 1908. E.J. Repson also went on to uh, write many other articles on South Indian coins. Uh, now we come to the life of one of the very interesting Indian scholars that is Bhagwan Lal Indraji. Bhagwan Lal Indraji was one of the first native Indian scholars. Uh, he worked very effectively both on Indian epigraphs and coins of Western India. Though he was mainly conversant only in Gujarati with a few letters of English, he ex extensively worked on Western Indian coins as well as sites. He also assisted uh, many European scholars and Indian scholars like Dr. Bhav Daji Lad in, his, in their papers on the subject. He conducted the Sopara excavations in North Mumbai where he discovered a Buddhist reliquary along with a Satwana portrait coin in 1822. Other objects also were found, but this was a very important discovery at that period. Now we come to one of the very uh, biggest breaking point in Indian numismatics. That was the uh, study of Gupta numismatics in a great detail. And this was aided by a discovery of a big hoard of Gupta coins in 1949, termed as the Bayana hoard. Uh, basically, this was a hoard of 1821 gold coins of various Gupta emperors located and found in the state of Bharatpur. Uh, interestingly, these coins first came to the view of the Maharaja of Bharatpur, Brajendra Savai, and he was not given an exact information about the antiquity of the coins. He ended up making a, uh, actually a cufflink out of these coins. So these, as you see in the slide, you can appreciate some of these coins were almost on the verge of being destroyed till it was brought to his attention by some uh, noticing people who said that this should be subjected to a proper study. Thus they came to call Professor Anand Sadashiv Altekar of the Banaras Hindu University and he began a systematic study of this hoard leading to a pioneering study of uh, Gupta numismatics in 1954 much uh, advanced than the preliminary study by scholars before his time. Also at uh, this period, it was important to know that the British Museum began documenting its own coin collection. One of the first uh, collections to be studied was the Mughal coins in their collection. And these were studied by the noted Arabic scholar and curator, Dr. Stanley Lane Poole. And he published two works, the first being the catalogue of Mughal coins in the British Museum. This was soon followed by another catalogue of Indian coins, but this again was done by John Allen, and it was done on the ancient coins of the British Museum collection. Thus began a trend of bringing out catalogues of important collections in various museums. Uh, chief amongst, the first amongst these was one by C.J. Rogers. It was uh, brought out in four volumes but this was again found to be incomplete and not well illustrated so it was finally followed by other studies by rb whitehead uh, on the coins of punjab and lahore and another by h nelson wright in the case of indian museum kolkata rb whitehead also went on to study and compile a number of lists of mughal mints of mughal coins which led to an important discussion on mughal coins uh, in this period. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, a very important event ha happened and this was the establishment of the Numismatic Society of India in 1910 and its journal, the JNSI as it is known, came to be published in 1939. Uh, also in this period, we also see the Numismatic Supplement to the Journal of Asiatic Society of Bengal 
began to be published from 1904. Both these publications were had contributions by various Indian and British numismatists to supplement the existing knowledge of various Indian coin series. Interestingly, also at this time, Dr. D. R. Bhandarkar was the first Indian who was appointed at Calcutta University under the Carmichael chair, uh, came to conduct his lectures on ancient Indian numismatics, which discussed numismatics in relation to various Vedic and later sources of Indian history. Also at this period, uh, the Taxila Bean Mound was excavated by John Hubert Marshall, where many ancient Indian coins were found along with Greek coins uh, in stratigraphic context. This was published as a two-volume book called Taxila by John Hubert Marshall, and it has a very important uh, understanding and a list of the coins that were found at Bean Mound. Uh, another person who contributed majorly at this period to the study of Mughal coins was Professor S. H. Hodiwala. He used his uh, expertise in Persian orthography and other primary sources of the Mughal period to make Mughal coins better understood, especially in the form of studying the dates of the coin and matching them with the original sources in the Mughal period. He wrote a very valuable book called as Historical Studies in Mughal Numismatics. This has been uh, recently enlarged and all his articles have been compiled by Dr. Sanjay Garg as Historical Studies in Mughal Mint Towns and other essays. This was published in 2015. Uh, one of the last personalities of the pre-independence period was Sir Mortimer Wheeler. He was the last British director of ASI and the author of a very important volume Rome Beyond Imperial Frontiers. Post-independence India saw a flourishing of Indian numismatic studies. Uh, largely much of this was done from the nationalist angle and chief amongst these studies were won by V.S. Agarwala. V.S. Agarwala was again a Sanskrit scholar and he compared a lot of numismatic references to Sanskrit sources. Another was Rai Bahadur Prayag Dayal and he conducted the first study of Avad coins in the Lucknow Museum. Another very important seminal achievement was by D.D. Kosambi. He brought out a very comprehensive text called Indian Numismatics, where he gave a lot of important statistical uh, concepts to numismatics which could be employed in the study of holds. Another study in the faraway part of the world was by Robert Gobel. Robert Gobel was founder of a numismatic institute in Vienna and he led a very interesting study of Kushan coins in various parts of the world, including Russia, India, and parts of Europe. Another interesting personality of this period was Charles Hubert Biddulph. Charles Hubert Biddulph was one of the Britishers of the post-independence period to revise and work on many South Indian series. Chief amongst this was his revision of the first study, earlier studies of Walter Elliot on South Indian coins. He thus wrote two books, Coins of the Cholas and Coins of the Pandyas, published by the Numismatic Society of India as monographs in the 1960s. Um, another uh, very dynamic personality who worked in both Indian numismatics and epigraphy was Professor Ajay Mitra Shastri. He was one of the first scholars to uh, basically pioneer and study a number of coins of Maharashtra. Uh, he was a professor at the Nagpur University. Another person who also again contributed a number of uh, books uh, basically focused on British India coins was F. Pridmore. F. Pridmore was again a, a person who brought out a whole catalogue of British Indian coins which are still studied as an important uh, source of in British India coins. Uh, one of the most important uh, developments of the post-independence period was the study of Indian coins as a continuous series by Dr. P. L. Gupta. Dr. P. L. Gupta was the founding father of Indian discipline of numismatics in the post-independence period. Chiefly his profound study of the subject with original ideas on the beginning of Indian coinages and carrying the entire series has been unparalleled in the history of Indian numismatics. His main role was also 
studying and recognizing the potential of this subject as a research subject encouraging generations of Indian numismatists with his book Coins which was published by the National Book Trust of India in 1969. This book which encompasses systematically all Indian coin series and treats Indian coinage as a tradition and continuity has been in continuous publication since 1969. Uh, this single book systematically covers all Indian series and treats Indian coinage as a tradition and continuity and has been studied by students of all generations for the last five decades. The main contribution of uh, Dr. P. L. Gupta thus continues and it was also enhanced by another study by Dr. B. N. Mukherjee who focused chiefly on both Indian uh, coins and early coins of the post Gupta Bengal. His exploration of ancient Indian coins led to thus two important books, Coins of Bengal and Numismatic Art of India. Numismatic Art of India published by the Indian Museum Kolkata was again an attempt to study numismatics as an art subject. Uh, three of his books also covered a number of numismatic topics. Thus, an uh, influential school of the Bengal school of numismatics was basically uh, guided and uh, mentored by Dr. B. N. Mukherjee. The post-independence generation of numismatics numismatists thus began utilizing a number of uh, new forums which were available to them. Chief amongst this one forum was the Indian History Congress. Another was the Oriental Numismatic Society which was established in uh, 1970 in London. Uh, this again has been uh, giving out a journal called the Journal of the Oriental Numismatic Society. Another was the Numismatic Digest which was published by the Indian Institute for Research in Numismatic Studies. This has again been in continuous print since 1977. Uh, both these journals have uh, uh, articles of great interest by researchers across the world. Another is studies in Indian in South Indian coins by the South Indian Numismatic Society established in 1991 and located in Chennai. The new trend amongst numismatists in India and abroad was now to use statistical figures given in various primary sources and museum catalogues to draw conclusions about the outputs of various coins. Chief of these were Mughal mints and also sometimes other series. Uh, also other topics which were studied were the monetization of the economy. A very comprehensive work was the imperial monetary system of Mughal India edited by a US historian G.F. Richards. Uh, this basically took into view the entire aspects of numismatics and took on board a number of historians, numismatists across the world to basically study uh, the subject in great detail. Uh, now we'll, uh, I would like to point out uh, the number of important uh, institutes and libraries and museums across the country and the world which might help the student to study numismatics. Uh, these include the Indian Museum Kolkata, the Asiatic Society Kolkata, the CSMES Prince of Wales Museum Mumbai, RBI Museum located in Fort Bombay, the Asiatic Society of Mumbai Library, the Indian Institute of Research in Numismatic Studies located in Anjaneri Nasik, the Numismatic Society of India located in the campus of the Banaras Hindu University and also having its museum the Bharat, Bharat Kala Bhavan in Varanasi, UP, the National Museum in New Delhi along with many other state museums also form a very important trove of Indian coins which have been utilized and can be utilized by the students. The British Museum, its coins and medals department is also a very helpful resource. The American Numismatic Society of New York again is very important because they have put up most of the coins online and then there are few other museums in the Western Europe region. So this brings us to the end of this uh, presentation where we look at we have looked at the historiography of Indian numismatics which we have traced back to the 19th century uh, and also gone through the historiography of western numismatics. 
which we have located and traced back to the Renaissance period. We have looked at its initial period when numismatics emerged both in the West and India to study various series of Indian coins both by Indian and British numismatics. We have also looked at the growth of Indian numismatics in the post-independence period which has continued as a trend both in India and in the West. We have also seen that how this can be now used and grown to more dynamic initiatives by both individual researchers and organizations. Thank you for watching uh, this video. For more information visit IE text and visit EPG Parchala.